Okay, if you want to introduce your talk now, thanks, Tom. Okay, great. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, yeah, hopefully, uh, I think I'll answer most of those questions. Um, if not all, yeah, pretty much most of them. The, uh, yeah, you raise an interesting point about the line between introduced and invasive. Um, but yeah, uh, so just to say hello, my name's Tom Major. Um, I'm gonna be talking to you this evening about uh, the Escalapian snakes in Colwyn Bay, which I've been studying as part of my PhD since 2017. Um, obviously it's been a bit of a weird time, particularly for doing field work in the last couple of years, but we've managed to do some. And um, I'm gonna be talking about the radio telemetry element of my PhD this evening. So thank you for coming. And uh, yeah, just to say my supervisory team, my main supervisor is Dr. Wolfgang Worcester. I'm also supervised by Dr. John Mully and Dr. Matt Hayward and Mr. Nick Jackson of the Welsh Mountain Zoo. Um, the Welsh Mountain Zoo are my um, commercial partner and um, I do my PhD sponsored by KES2, which is just a, an organization which gets PhDs going in Wales. So without further ado, I'll start the talk. Okay, so just a brief outline of what I'm going to talk about today. So I'll start off talking about the Escalapian snake. What is an Escalapian snake? Where did they come from? Why do they have such a bizarre and difficult to pronounce name? And then I'll talk about my radio tracking project, which I've been doing as part of my PhD in Colwyn Bay. Okay, so uh, these are Escalapian snakes, Aminus longissimus. They are a wide ranging European species. They're found all over Europe. You'll see a range map uh, shortly. Um, they're non-venomous, so they're actually a constricting species of snake. Um, they have no venom as far as humans are concerned. Um, and they kill their prey by grabbing hold of it and then throwing some coils around it and squeezing them until they interrupt blood flow or the uh, animal suffocates. Um, they actually have quite a varied diet in their native range. Um, there's quite a lot written about these snakes, being as they're from all over Europe. So um, countries like France, Spain, Germany, all have Escalapian snakes. And in their native range, they eat all sorts of different things. They'll quite often eat uh, lizards. They'll eat lots of small mammals. Um, they'll eat birds. And um, yeah, occasionally they'll also eat arthropods. There's been a couple of cases where they've eaten beetles and things like that. Um, but generally speaking, they're thought to be lizard, bird and mammal eaters. Okay, so um, Escalapian snakes have quite a rich history with people actually. Um, so you can see in that image on the right hand side there, this is actually a Roman coin with uh, an image of an Escalapian snake on it. So the Greek god Asclepios, who is the same Greco-Roman god as Escla Escalapius, uh, the Greco-Roman god of medicine, a son of Apollo, and uh, yeah, famed for having healing abilities. And some say that he could transform into a snake. And sure enough, if he were to transform into a snake, it would be the Escalapian snake. And um, this kind of um, Greco-Roman history is also represented in the scientific name of this species, which is Zominus longissimus. So Zominus is actually ancient Greek. It means the great one or fierce. And longissimus is Latin for the long one. So the great fierce long one, which is quite an appropriate name for well, it's quite a large snake, although I would I would probably stop short of calling them fierce necessarily. They are very timid animals. Um, in fact, there are some relic populations, so like small populations uh, in northern Europe. Um, and it was actually thought that the Romans were responsible for moving the snakes around and actually leaving them in areas where they had temples. Although this theory has actually been debunked in recent history using genetic methods. Uh, it turns out the Romans didn't move them around. They just used to have a much broader range and they've subsequently shrunk. So speaking of the range, this is the current range of the Escalapian snake. So in yellow, you can see it's widespread in Central and Southern Europe. And then there's a few little yellow dots towards the top of uh, Northern Europe. And um, these are relic populations in Germany and the Czech Republic. So these are sort of remnants of what used to be a much broader range uh, up into Northern Europe, but has subsequently shrunk southwards as the climate has changed and got cooler and a little bit less hospitable for these snakes. So these relic populations tend to remain in really nice, warm river valleys and other areas of suitable habitat. Um, but for the most part, the, the species has moved south. And there are three populations in the UK. Uh, which are introduced populations. The snake did actually um, have a home natively in the UK uh, over 100,000 years ago. It went extinct naturally because of the Ice Age. Um, but there's now three populations in the UK. One is in North Wales, which is the population I study in Colwyn Bay. There's also a population in London. 
Let me, there we go. Yeah, there's also a population in London, uh, which is on the banks of the Regent's Canal, really close to London Zoo. Um, obviously, a lot of people initially thought that London Zoo were responsible for that introduction. But um, as it turns out, it was actually this organization called the Inner London Education Authority. And they had six or seven Escalapian snakes, um, sort of like educational animals for the kids when they came. And at some point along the way, they escaped and they actually managed to set up a breeding population in London. And that happened in the 1980s. Uh, the population I study in Colwyn Bay has been there since the 1960s. Um, the former uh, director of the Welsh Mountain Zoo used to import reptiles and at some point along the line, one or possibly a few, story is that it might even have just been one female who was gravid with eggs who escaped, laid her eggs and then subsequently inbred with her offspring, although that we, we don't know that yet. Um, we may be able to see something of that in the genetic investigations that we're taking out, but certainly there was a very small founding population of maximum a few individuals. And in the early 1960s, uh, Nick Jackson, who is the current director of the Welsh Mountain Zoo, saw a baby snake crossing the path in the grounds of the zoo, thought, what is that? Picked it up, realized it wasn't a grass snake, although they do look quite similar, especially as juveniles. And... Um, Sure enough, he consulted his reptile guide and it turned out that little baby snake was actually a baby Escalapian snake. And they've been breeding in the wild in Colwyn Bay ever since then, so the early 1960s. And then the third population, which is far and away the most mysterious population uh, in Bridge End in South Wales. Um, this population was only first talked about in scientific literature last year. Um, Basically, someone found some snakes in their garden and told some herpetologists who wrote about it. And it was assumed because there was both adults and sub-adult individuals in this one garden that there must be a population that was breeding. Having said that, we had a master's student at Cardiff University looking for the snakes uh, all last summer. And unfortunately, he didn't find any. So um, it's a bit of a, a mystery, a bit of a smoking gun uh, in Bridge End. Uh, there's like a massive railway line, which is obviously quite inaccessible for people surveying for reptiles. So it's entirely likely that they're just living along, along this railway line. But that population is a bit of a mystery. But certainly we know the ones in Colwyn Bay and the ones in um, London also are breeding successfully in the wild and could be considered uh, introduced populations. Okay, so yeah, this is uh, just a map to show you where our study site is. You can see we're right up far north Wales. I'm sure it's an area which is familiar to all of you, um, Colwyn Bay. Um, and yeah, the grounds of the Welsh Mountain Zoo and surrounding fields and woodland is where the study takes place. And that, that purple block is just kind of a, a sort of um, vague idea of where the snakes are known to be, where they've been found. Okay, so as part of my PhD, I've been doing an ongoing assessment of the population status and dynamics. So in order to do this, we've been doing lots of surveys. So we look around for snakes. Uh, we just, we walk around looking for snakes and we also put out uh, sheets of roofing felt. So the idea behind those is they're big and they're black. You put them down in a field next to a hedgerow. The sun shines down on the refugia. That's what we call them. You come along and because they've got warm in the sun, the snakes have chosen to look so to sort of hide under there. And when you come along and lift it up, you hopefully find a snake underneath. So that works quite well. And we've been doing that since 2017. And every snake we catch, we give a unique ID, uh, we mark it. So for adults, we put a tiny little microchip in them, same as you'd get for your dog or your cat, except for much smaller if you went to your vet. And with the juveniles, what we do is we actually um, implant this fluorescent dye underneath the skin. And when you shine a black light on the snake, it glows. So that in the right hand image there, that's when you're shining a black light on it, it actually fluoresces. So it gives you a really good indication that, yeah, there's a mark under there. But if you were to look at it in normal daylight, it would be virtually invisible. Um, and the reason we mark the juveniles like this is because firstly, they're too small for microchips, but also um, they go through what's known as an ontogenic change as they grow. So when they're babies, they have this nice yellow collar that you can see in this individual here. And they also have these unique chin patterns, which you can use to identify them. But as they get older, all of that disappears. And you basically end up with a snake that's brown on top, yellow underneath, with very little um, in the way of distinguishing characters. So to combat that, we mark them all. And um, we were actually the first people to put this stuff in snakes. It's used in a lot of different animals. Um, but yeah, it worked really, really well. And we've recaptured snakes after three years that are significantly larger. And um, sure enough, they've still got their little spots of elastomer in the same place. So it's worked really well. And um, 
through doing the mark recapture study, um, we've managed to estimate the number of individuals and the estimate currently is around 85 adults and 120 juveniles in a given year. Okay, so finding snakes. So I think it's something which uh, is really important to understand when you think about studying uh, reptiles, but snakes in particular, is that they're extremely secretive animals, more so than uh, any animal I can think of. Maybe the exception, the only animal I can think of which is more secretive would be um, Sicilians, which are these sort of worm-like amphibians that live underground. They're famously difficult to find because they very seldomly come to the surface. But beyond Sicilians, I think snakes are one of the most difficult animals to find. Um, when we're surveying, we average about one snake every six hours, which gives you an impression of how hard it is. And I like to think we're okay at it, at least, um, certainly better than one every six hours. But the reason they're so hard to find is because they have this low detectability. So if you're walking through an area, um, you might only see, even if you're looking, between one and two percent of the snakes that are actually there. So, you know, if there's 100 snakes and you only see one, it's going to take some time to find them. So in order to find snakes for our radio telemetry study, we've been doing the surveys that I mentioned before. Um, in addition to that, we've had some real success um, thanks to local people in Colwyn Bay, um, some amazing people who happen to have snakes in their garden who very kindly let us have a look and um, track them as well. So there's a few houses that applies to. One of them is uh, this place with this massive black tarpaulin. So this tarpaulin, is, uh, you can see it's in a very heavily vegetated area. It's actually covering a, a log pile, which has been in situ for over 20 years, and the snakes love it. They just, in there's a, there's a few weeks, particularly in the beginning of the year, where they're trying to get warm. They're coming out of hibernation, and if you turn that black tarpaulin over where it's been in the sun, you can reliably find snakes. So four of the five males we actually tracked with, using radio telemetry this year were caught under that tarpaulin. So that's been an incredible resource. Um, beyond that, uh, we also do some flyering. So you can see an example of my flyer there. If anyone lives in Colwyn Bay, they may well have had one of these through their door. Um, we haven't had a huge uptake on the flyers. Um, I think most people who have snakes maybe know that they have them already. Um, but yeah, we still live in hope and um, we have had a couple of leads and it's always good to talk to interested people anyway. But yeah, it's hard to find the snakes. So that is one of the major challenges is just finding enough snakes to actually study. Okay, so in order to do well, radio telemetry i'll speak a little bit about the method so this is a method that was pioneered in the 1980s but is still extremely relevant today and the way it works is you get a radio transmitter so you can see in my hand in that left hand image that is what a radio transmitter looks like i've actually got one here i don't know how well you'll be able to see that but they're very small um they really are tiny and what we do is we surgically implant these into the body cavity of the snake and you get about four or five months battery life out of them. So once you've implanted the radio transmitter in the snake, uh, you go out with your radio kit and you can see one of my volunteers, Guillaume, modeling the kit in this right-hand image. You have an antenna, which is extremely directional and you point that around. And then the receiver in his left hand actually decodes the radio signal from the transmitter and produces an audible beep. And then what you can do by fiddling with the dials on the receiver is basically get it. So you can just only just barely hear it. And then whichever direction you point in, you get a very faint beep. And that gives you a really strong idea of which direction the snake's in. And so you keep doing that. You get closer and closer. When you think you're starting to get close, you, you begin to sort of do multiple angles. So you might go one this way, one this way. And where those points intersect, you start to get an impression through triangulation of where the snake might be. So it's extremely labor intensive. It's also extremely fun. Um, but uh, yeah, you have to get out there and actually find the snakes. A lot of people are probably familiar with um, GPS studies. So a lot of the time, people who have the good fortune to study birds and whales, and dolphins and penguins and larger animals actually stick gps trackers on the animals and what that does is it'll every 10 or 15 minutes it'll ping the gps tell you exactly where that animal is we don't have that luxury we're still using technology that was pioneered in the 1980s but it is still valuable and um, we go and we find the snakes twice every day once in the morning around 10 a.m and once in the afternoon at around 2 p.m and uh, when you've got quite a few snakes on the go that it can be a pretty intense day okay so um this is just a brief uh, demonstration of how many snakes we tracked and how long for. So you can see females in red, males in blue. Um, and we tracked nine snakes this year. So we caught nine snakes that were big enough for transmitters. And you can see the amount of time. So it's time along the bottom. These are the months of the summer. 
uh, starting in June. And um, yeah, we managed to track this. We managed to track nine snakes. You can see the tracking um, durations vary quite a lot. Um, and we'll get into the reasons for that later on. Um, but yeah, I was really pleased to just find nine snakes that were big enough. Okay, so um, this is quite a busy image. But basically, if you look at the left-hand image, that is a map of the Welsh Mountain Zoo. So you've got the Welsh Mountain Zoo in the kind of like bottom right here. And then these are just fields and woodland surrounding. And then the white is the kind of major roads of the area. So that white is replicated in this right-hand image by the gray lines. So you can really see um, the blue chunks, each blue blob is the space use of one tracked snake in our study, one tracked male, and each red blob is a the space use of one tracked female so you can see basically this is just all the places all our snakes went plotted onto one map um this little blue one here is a good example so this is um these are all the locations that we got for a particular tracked male and you can see if you look at this side he was really just mooching around these meadows uh there's like a row of houses here he was in some of these gardens um but yeah these are the these are the home ranges so the females females in red there's one one massive female range that kind of spans the entirety of all of this woodland and this side here. And then there's two tiny little ones uh, up here. So this is actually two individual female ranges and both those females inhabited um, one person's garden, which was quite remarkable really. The, the variation in the ranges between the females is massive. Okay, so I'm just gonna go in depth into a couple of the individuals, give you an idea of what an Escalapian snake actually gets up to. So the first one we're gonna talk about is called Jeff. So Jeff was a male, obviously he came from the aforementioned woodpile. And this is just a moving image, giving you an idea of where the snake went. So this is, uh, the, this red dot moves throughout uh, June to September of this year. And you can see that a lot of the time Jeff was kind of stationary. So right now he's just sat for a few days and then he did a couple of big forays back and forth along this bank of woodland. Um, you've got the Welsh Mountain Zoo actually, oops, uh, in the right-hand side of this image. And then this is a care home down here. So he spent a lot of his time in the grounds of this care home, but he went back and forth to the Welsh Mountain Zoo a couple of times. And these are some of the habitats that Jeff was inhabiting during his summer. So uh, the left-hand image is actually the wall of the care home. Um, it's uh, a massive old building and uh, a fair few of the snakes that we were tracking actually quite liked going in there. So I think to them, a building like this, the wall space, the cavities inside just represent a safe refuge away from predators, probably relatively consistent temperature where they can hold up for quite a few days at a time. What you tend to see with snakes is that they'll have a activity period of maybe four, five, six days. Um, and then they'll have a couple of days where they just, uh, excuse me, they'll have a, an activity period of two or three days and then they'll find somewhere to hole up and they'll hole up for four, five, six, seven days. So I think that corresponds to the snakes are out hunting. Once they find something to eat, they just go somewhere safe and digest their food. And that can take up to and over a week of inactivity. Um, and so this image in the top right is a pile of debris. Uh, we just saw Jeff mooching around in here one day. Uh, they seem to quite like things like this, uh, whether they're hunting in them or seeking refuge. I suspect they're looking for mice and things like that. And then similarly, uh, this very dense ivy covered bank in the bottom right. This is really, really typical habitat that they'll use. Um, they love being in areas which where they can't be seen. And um, yeah, they can just move undetected basically. So yeah, he spent quite a lot of time in these kinds of areas. And this is Jeff's space use over the course of the time in which he was tracked, which is about three months. And um, you can see that, uh, so the, the lightest blue around the edge, this is kind of what, what's called 99% um, likelihood that he was there. So essentially that's like a really optimistic um, sort of overestimation of where he might have been going. Uh, he may have occasionally sort of forayed into these lighter blue bits but really the, the the main sort of space use area are these darker shaded areas and then you may or may not be able to see but there's a couple of tiny little spots in here which are even darker and those represent the refuge areas that he took and was in for extended periods of time this one up here is the care home and the other place he took refuge was actually the roof of someone's house where he was for a couple of weeks all told and yeah the total area he inhabited 
around 7.3 hectares. Okay, so this figure is just um, motion variance. So you can think of this as, is the snake moving more or less than previously? And you can see here, and there's this big chunk of movement, which is extremely unusual for the rest of the year. You can see, generally speaking, he wasn't really moving around a lot. He had a bit of a spell in mid-July where he was going around, but the main activity of this snake throughout the year in terms of distance traveled was this chunk in June where he was just really, really active. And that was reflected in the uh, in the in the GIF we saw. That that was the period where he was zipping back and forth between the zoo and the care home. And so this is uh, the Clamroos Road, and I had my suspicions as to why he was so active in uh, June. It is thought to be the breeding season for the species, but um, no one had actually actively seen it. So one day I was tracking Jeff. And I was in the zoo grounds, which is the other side of this wall that you can see in the picture here. And I had the suspicion that he was sort of uh, on this stone wall, but I came round to the roadside just to check um, in case he was actually over the road. And as I walked down the road, I looked at the top of the wall and I actually saw uh, two tails intertwined. So this is actually Jeff mating with an unknown female. Um, I didn't bother them. I just let them get on with it. Um, but yeah, really, really cool insight into their kind of reproductive ecology that you just would never get if you weren't tracking the snakes actively. Okay, so this is Frida. Um, Frida is one of the females in our study. Really beautiful snake. Um, this is where we found Frida. So uh, this is just the edge of a meadow. Um, quite often this meadow will have sheep in it, but for whatever reason, the last couple of years it's been left. And we actually caught her while we were tracking another snake. So we had a male who, who was already inhabiting this field and we went looking for him. He was called Freddie. And we saw two snakes coiled in the brambles on the left-hand side of the image, just basking in the sun. And my first instinct was that it was Freddie that we'd spotted, maybe mating with a female. So um, I was like, oh, better, you know, give him some space, get back, because we're always trying not to disturb them. But then one of my field assistants, Antonio, wasn't convinced that this was um, Freddie that we could see. So he took the radio kit and went around the side. And sure enough, he realized that the signal from Freddie was coming from way deeper in the undergrowth. So the two snakes that were basking on the hedge were actually completely different new ones. And um, we caught them both, and one of them was uh, Frida. So that's how we added her to the study. And this is a GIF showing Frida's movement uh, throughout the study period. So you can see a lot of the time she was just near the meadows where she uh, where she was caught, which is sort of this area. But then she did one very large move uh, up to the grounds of the zoo in sort of mid July time. Um, aside from that, she was very localized. There's actually a, a chapel which she was hanging out in the roof of quite a lot. Um, and in between times, she was just sort of mooching around the meadows. But yeah, this big move to the zoo was very interesting. So these are some of the habitats that we saw Frida in. So this is the meadow, which I mentioned before. Um, and then the left hand side is actually the woodland. We saw her traveling through this woodland a couple of times. And it was really cool because she was actually at the very base of um, this tree, which is cool because it's the kind of place you'd expect to see a snake, but you just never get to see one there if it weren't for the fact that you've got a, a transmitter in them because she was almost invisible, just tucked in amongst the roots. But that's where she chose to rest up overnight one night. And uh, this is Frida's range. So again, um, you can see the darker blue is her kind of like main area of influence. And yeah, her range was pretty huge. It was 10.68 hectares over the course of the study. That's her space use. So I mentioned that in mid-July, Frida went on a big move to the zoo. And where she went was actually the dung pile, which is where the zoo collects all of the manure and waste from all the animals. And it sort of slowly uh, decomposes. And uh, yeah, sure enough, we didn't actually find Frida's eggs. These are eggs from a different snake. Um, we found these eggs a couple of years ago, but we have uh, we already had suspicions. We know that they go to the dung pile to nest. So we can't say for certain that that's what Frida was doing, but she basically traveled about 500 meters over the course of a few days, stayed a couple of days in the base of the dung pile and then went straight back. And it was around the time when we anticipate them laying eggs. So pretty confident that's what she was doing. We can't say for certain, but we do know that this dung pile is used for laying eggs and so are compost heaps in people's gardens. They like rotting vegetation, like so many other snakes. They just need somewhere which has got a sort of relatively stable temperature, good humidity and human piles of rubbish really fulfill both those needs. 
And this is her uh, movement variant. So this is just to show that, yeah, in the middle of July, Frida was traveling uh, significantly more than she was any other time of year. Okay, so um, I've kind of touched on it briefly, but how much space do Welsh Escalapian snakes actually use um, in sort of a relevant, <laughs> a sort of relatable uh, figure? So we had uh, three tracked females and they had a mean space use over the summer of 3.72 hectares. But you can see we had a massive range. So two of the females did virtually nothing. They hardly moved while um, one of them, uh, Frida, actually had 10 hectares of space used. Um, males, of which we had five, their mean space use was about 3.83 hectares, but again, a massive range. But just to put that into perspective, uh, these snakes sort of on average are using uh, between three and four rugby pitches worth of area every summer in their wanderings, which is quite impressive really for um, something which has to crawl along on its belly. And uh, I think it, it, it may come as a surprise to some people that snakes actually move that much. Okay, so um, I alluded in my earlier slide to the fact that some of the tracking durations uh, weren't that long. So um, people are probably wondering what happened to the cold wind nine. Uh, so these are the nine snakes that we tracked. Um, majority of them have names. Um, so the first one we had was number 73. We called him Cobain. Uh, unfortunately, he was actually eaten by a buzzard after only three weeks of tracking. So he was right at the edge of the grounds of the Welsh Mountain Zoo, um, near the bottom of this tree. And he didn't move for a couple of days. He was just resting up. And then on the third day we came and the, the signal from the transmitter was coming from really high up in the tree, like really high. And there wasn't at that time really a precedent for the snakes to climb trees. And in fact, there really was never a precedent for them climbing that high up a tree. We saw them at sort of chest height a few times. Um, but yeah, after a couple of weeks of the signal consistently being from, well, after a, a, about a week, I decided I was gonna have a real thorough investigation into what was going on. So I walked around the base of every single tree in the area and just like put my uh, receiving kit up against it. And there was one tree in particular that had a really, really strong signal. And when I looked, got my binoculars out and had a look up in the treetops, there was actually a buzzer's nest right at the top, um, which was active. It had parents coming and going and two baby, well, nearly fledgling buzzards at that point. So um, yeah, pretty certain that the buzzards ate Cobain, which is real, um, it, was a, it was a shock and it's sad obviously because you're tracking them, but very fascinating insight into the uh, life histories of these snakes. So then we had um, a couple who survived, uh, 137 was a male, he lived the whole time. Similarly, Jeff, uh, his transmitter battery ran out, so uh, he's, he's still good as far as we know. And then we had number 142 called Nessie. Um, she was unfortunately hit by a car. Uh, this was a really sad one because um, she'd been hanging out in uh, a garden for pretty much the entire time that we tracked her. And then after a couple of months, she decided she was going to go walkabouts. And she was in a little stone wall right next to a road by the zoo. And I came to track her in the morning, uh, the day after that. And I was just walking up the road. I was excited because she'd moved. She never really went anywhere. And I knew that she was gravid with eggs. She was getting ready to lay eggs. So I thought, okay, she's on her way to lay the eggs. We're going to see where she lays them. This would be fantastic. Unfortunately, I walked up the road and I bumped into a couple of um, local residents and they asked me what I was doing with, with my radio kit. And I said, oh, I'm looking for a snake. And the lady said to me, oh, there's a snake run over down there. And sure enough, I turned around and it was Nessie. Um, and she did have four perfectly formed eggs inside her ready to go. So I suspect she, she may even have been making her way to the dung pile. She was going in the right direction, can't say. But um, yeah, that was, that was a real shame. Um, but you know, it's a very common affliction. Uh, herpetologists refer to it as Dunlop disease and it's extremely common. So uh, 149, Freddie, he also died uh, this time of a stoat predation. So that was a big shock. Um, didn't really anticipate them being eaten by stoats, but based on the corpse that we found, um, he'd had his neck broken and then a series of um, small incisions, a little bit of meat eaten and some organs consumed, which apparently is, according to um, people who study mammals, that is quite a, a sort of key feature of um, mustelid predation. So suspect that he was eaten by a stoat. Um, I wondered if it might be a cat, but cats don't, in my experience, cats don't really tend to eat stuff. So it, it, it could have been a cat, but I, I suspect it was a stoat. Um, and now this was a big shock, Frida, 159, the one I was talking about earlier, she was actually eaten by another snake, another snake, which we were tracking, number 137. Um, 
yeah, it took a while to realize. I thought that the snakes were just for some reason hanging around together outside of the breezing season. But after a, a few days or even about 10 days, probably of them being closely um, associated, you very seldom actually see the snakes. You're usually tracking a bush or a rock. You just know they're there. So I hadn't had a, a visual on her for a long time and um, started to get a bit suspicious. And one of my field assistants, Becca, uh, in the end, picked up number 137, pulled him out of a bush. And when we pointed the receiver at him, trained to Frida's signal, sure enough, he had actually eaten her. He had both transmitters inside him, which was a really big shock. Um, this species isn't known to be uh, cannibalistic at all. Uh, as far as I know, it's the first record of this snake eating another of the same species there's a suggestion that maybe they there's someone saw one eat a grass snake in the past but yeah for the most part it's um pretty novel observation and uh yeah a really big shock uh, i was extremely surprised to see that um and yeah just an honorable mention neither of none of our track snakes were eaten by these animals but i know definitely that cats and badgers both eat escalapian snakes i've seen a badger, um, the remains of a badger attack, which is basically just a, a snake skin with no meat and a bit of spine, but inside out, um, which apparently is indicative of badgers. And uh, we've had quite a few, um, probably five or six, with just small puncture wounds and having not been eaten, which, um, according to Garden Wildlife Health, is almost certainly attributable to cats. So, yeah, quite a few threats to this species is kind of what we've... Um, noticed through doing this telemetry and th their survival across years is probably not great once they're adults um we are going to do some analysis to compare track to uh, snakes with transmitters to snakes without transmitters but there have been some studies like that in the past and the suggestion is that the effects of transmitters are minor to negligible so yeah it looks like these snakes just live extremely dangerous lives and we've seen what eats them what do they eat um well mostly mice uh loads of mice especially when they're babies it's exclusively baby mice um, and then once they get a bit bigger you start to see the occasional um, nest raid um, yeah seen a couple of blackbird chicks be regurgitated by the snakes a robin and a robin's egg um, but yeah mostly uh, mostly mice um, and actually a mole once as well which was a bit of a shock um, a snake regurgitated a baby mole and it was really obvious it was a mole just because of the hands that they have um, but that was a surprise as well. But the the kind of modus operandi of these animals is that they'll cruise around and once they catch a scent, if there's a mouse in a hole, they'll get down there and they'll eat the entire family of mice. And similarly, if they come across a bird's nest in a hedge, they'll eat as, as many of the occupants as they can find, essentially. <laughs> there's a mole. Okay, so what's next? Um, so I want to do some more analysis. I've analyzed the movement data in so far as like how much movement how much uh, space are the snakes using and sort of plotting their space use on maps. Um, I'm really interested to learn what, like what drives their decision-making. So there's something called step selection functions. You kind of categorize all the habitat and then you look at the movement path the snake has taken and it will tell you what is making snakes make decisions. So, okay, it's gone, the snakes decided to go this way. Why? What, what is, what's the habitat that's sort of, influencing that decision, which I think will be really interesting. And kind of building on that, we're going to have a, another master's student uh, coming in summer, and she's really interested in what constitutes sort of corridors, like what, what will the snakes move through versus what they won't. And what she's going to do is she's going to intensively track a small number of individuals. So where I've been tracking all the snakes twice a day, she's going to track two or three snakes every hour. And hopefully with that, we'll get some more fine scale data on their kind of movement choices, and we'll be able to pick apart what kind of habitat they move through and hopefully inform kind of what might potentially be avenues of spread. You know, if they're only willing to move along hedgerows, you can say with some confidence that they need hedgerows to move around. And yeah, track more snakes in 2022 and get a better idea about all of these things. So yeah, just to say thank you to um, all of the volunteers who helped me. Uh, I've got an amazing team and other students, the staff at the Welsh Mountain Zoo, who are just incredible, incredibly helpful, and all the local residents who have been exceptionally kind, uh, letting me mooch around their gardens every day and just, uh, yeah, sounding boards for ideas. It's been fantastic. So yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for listening. And um, quick bit of shameless self-promotion. If you want to hear me talk about snakes some more, I actually do a podcast. Um, which I seldom get an opportunity to advertise. So I thought I'd mention it. It's called Herpetological Highlights. It's about reptile science. Um, but yeah, thank you very much for listening. <laughs>